Every level of the internet explained. Level one, the surface web. This is where everyone starts. The internet's front door, the light that shines from the top of the iceberg while the rest hides below. You open Chrome, type a URL, hit enter, and boom, you're in level one, the most visible, commercialized, and sanitized layer of the digital world. Everything here is built to be seen. It's the glossy storefront of the internet, bright, interactive, full of motion. Search engines like Google and Bing crawl through it endlessly, indexing billions of pages so you can find whatever you want with a few keystrokes. News articles, TikTok clips, YouTube channels, Wikipedia, Amazon, all of it lives here, floating on the calm surface of the network ocean. The surface web runs on the standard backbone of the internet, HTTP and HTTPS, the protocols that move data between your device and remote servers. Each click sends a request. Each request fetches a response, all happening in milliseconds. It's so fast you forget the complexity underneath. Cookies track your activity, ads follow your gaze, and algorithms quietly tailor your experience, all to keep you scrolling. But here's the catch. This world, vast as it seems, is only a sliver of reality. Every visible page you can find through Google represents less than 10% of what actually exists online. Everything else is hidden behind layers of privacy, encryption, or intent. That means 90% of the Internet is invisible to you right now, locked away behind credentials, codes, or shadows. Still, the surface web is where billions live their digital lives. It's safe enough to invite your grandma, structured enough for governments, and commercial enough to power trillion-dollar companies. It's where memes are born, influencers rise, and the average person's perception of the Internet begins and ends. And that's just level one. You can spot this level when the design feels polished, when the ads feel targeted, when the pages are meant for everyone. It's the Internet's mask, smiling, familiar, and inviting. But just beneath that mask, things start to twist. Links turn into tunnels, the light fades, and you begin to descend. Level 2. The Bergy Web. Now the water gets cloudy. You've left the polished storefront and slipped into the side alley of the Internet, the Bergy Web. It's not quite hidden, but not exactly public either. This is where the rules start to blur, and the Internet begins to feel alive. The Bergy Web is the Internet's gray zone, a layer filled with content that search engines can't easily index or aren't allowed to show you. You won't find these places by typing in keywords. You need the exact URL, the right link passed around in forums, or a bit of digital instinct. It's the space of proxy sites, piracy hubs, cracked software mirrors, and underground communities that survive one takedown at a time. Think of it as the back room of the surface web, the part behind the employees only sign. Here, you'll find streaming sites that mirror Netflix originals before they hit Blu-ray, forum threads that host leaks, banned content, or obscure archives that no algorithm dares recommend. And because it operates in that twilight space, it's constantly mutating, disappearing today, resurfacing tomorrow under a new name, new domain, new IP. But don't mistake this for the dark web yet. This isn't about anonymity. It's about access. The Bergy web is still reachable with an ordinary browser, but it hides from Google's spotlight on purpose. It's not technically illegal to be here, but what happens here often drifts near the edge. Pirated software, movie torrents, unlicensed streams, digital gray markets thrive here because it's easier to bend the rules when nobody's really looking. Unlike level one, which rewards visibility, this level values secrecy and survival. Creators don't chase clicks, they dodge takedowns. Communities form around niche obsessions, from conspiracy boards to early hacker circles, and thrive on the feeling of being just out of reach. You'll notice how the tone changes here. Fewer company logos, more raw text, more anonymity, and there's something oddly magnetic about that. It's chaotic, unpredictable, and unfiltered, the wild frontier of the accessible internet. You can spot this level when a link feels risky, when you hesitate before clicking enter, because you know, deep down, you're not supposed to be here. And yet, you keep going. The digital water gets darker, the air gets colder, and waiting below, the deep web opens like a black gate. Level 3, the deep web. Now you're officially below the surface. The light from level one is gone, the noise from level two fades away, and suddenly everything feels quiet. This is the deep web, the true mass of the internet iceberg, stretching endlessly beneath what most people ever see. It's not criminal, not chaotic, it's just hidden. The deep web holds everything that's private, personalized, 
or protected, the data that defines who we are online. When you log into your email, access your bank account, open your cloud storage, or check your health records, you're not surfing the visible web. You're already deep in it. Here, every page is locked behind an identity check. No Google crawler can reach your inbox. No search engine indexes your financial dashboard. The deep web exists because privacy has to exist, because not everything should be public. It's the machinery that runs the world quietly. Away from the chaos of social feeds and trending tags, this layer makes up over 90% of the Internet's total size. Entire university archives, encrypted company databases, private research networks, all of it lives here, invisible to search, but essential to modern life. Governments manage national security systems inside it. Corporations guard their algorithms. Hospitals host sensitive medical data under encryption, thicker than steel. It's the Internet's working core, secure, efficient, and mostly unseen. Unlike the Bergy web, the deep web doesn't rely on secrecy. It relies on permissions. You can't just wander in. You must be recognized. A password, a token, a biometric scan, something that says you belong here. Without it, the doors stay locked no matter how hard you dig. Technically, it uses the same foundations as the Surface Web, HTTP, HTTPS, servers, browsers, but its pages are dynamic. They don't even exist until you request them. When you search your inbox or check your account history, the page is generated in real time, assembled from secure databases only for you, then disappears again. You can spot this level when the site asks, log in. That's your sign. You've stepped into the deep web. And while this layer keeps civilization running, it also guards the path downward. Because deeper still lies something darker, a world where privacy becomes anonymity and anonymity becomes power. Down there, the lights never come on. Welcome to the dark web. Level 4, the dark web. This is where the internet stops pretending to be safe. The light is gone now. You've crossed into the dark web, a hidden realm where anonymity is absolute and the rules of the surface no longer apply. You can't just open Chrome and type your way in. You need Tor, short for the Onion Router, a special browser that wraps your connection in layers of encryption, like peeling an onion in reverse. Each layer bounces your your signal between random servers across the globe, so nobody knows who you are or where you came from. Your IP vanishes, your identity dissolves, you become a shadow among shadows. That's the allure and the danger, because here, total freedom attracts total chaos. On one side, you'll find whistleblowers, journalists, and activists using it to evade censorship or communicate safely under oppressive regimes. On the other, you'll find marketplaces for the forbidden, where stolen data, illegal weapons, hacked accounts, and entire identities are sold like groceries. Imagine Amazon, but every item feels like a felony. Some of the most infamous sites in Internet history lived here. Silk Road, the digital black market run by Ross Ulbricht under the alias Dread Pirate Roberts. It operated like a libertarian dream, a free economy, no government oversight, total anonymity. But success brought exposure. Law enforcement tracked it down, traced a single slip, a login from a public library, and shut it all down. Still, for every site that falls, five more rise in its place. You can find almost anything here if you know where to look. Fake passports, leaked government documents, live hacking services, even hitmen for hire scams. But make no mistake, most of what you see is bait, fake, or worse. The deeper you click, the more the web starts staring back. Viruses hide behind innocent links. Scammers impersonate law enforcement. You can't tell who's watching or what's real. But the dark web isn't just crime and horror. It's also resistance. It's the place where truth leaks when the rest of the internet looks away. Platforms like SecureDrop let whistleblowers share classified information without being traced. Oppressed citizens use it to bypass surveillance, speak freely, and stay alive. You can spot this level when websites end in dot .onion, when your connection feels unstable but your heartbeat doesn't. The air here hums with tension, half rebellion, half paranoia. It's the Internet's black market, its secret diary, its confession booth. And just when you think this is the bottom, you realize something unsettling. The map doesn't end here. There's a rumor of something deeper, a digital trench with no confirmed entrance. The next level isn't proven, but it's whispered about in every corner of the web. They call it Mariana's Web. Level 5, Mariana's Web. Now we're leaving the real and drifting into myth. This is the Mariana's Web, the Internet's version of the Mariana Trench, the deepest, darkest pit known to man. Except this one isn't made of water. It's made of secrets, speculation, and fear.
No one has ever proven it exists. And yet, everyone who's been near the edge swears it does. According to the stories, Mariana's web isn't just hidden, it's unknowable. You can't reach it with Tor. You can't brute force your way in. Rumors say it's locked behind encryption so advanced that only quantum computers could even begin to decode it. Some claim it's a secret military network storing the world's most classified data, nuclear codes, advanced AI projects, extraterrestrial research, maybe even the real internet itself. Others say it's a living system, a digital ecosystem running on biological computing, using organic patterns and DNA-level encryption to store information beyond human comprehension. It sounds impossible, but that's the point. Mariana's web exists more as a mirror than a map, reflecting our deepest fear that somewhere, something bigger than us, is online. The myth began in early hacker forums, where users described a forbidden zone below the dark web, a place you could only reach by completing a series of cryptographic puzzles or proving your identity to the network itself. Once inside, they said, you could see everything, every government secret, every hidden program, every algorithm that runs the world. No browser, no interface, no user-friendly anything. Just direct access to the raw nervous system of the internet. Of course, none of it's been verified. No screenshots, no code, no credible evidence. But that hasn't stopped the myth from spreading, because it feels like it could be true. We already live in a world of invisible surveillance, classified data centers, and algorithms that know us better than we know ourselves. Is it really so hard to imagine that something lies beneath all that? A master layer of control? Unreachable? Untouchable? Unseen? You can spot this level only in stories, whispers, and conspiracy threads. When people talk about the internet below the internet, they're talking about this. And while most call it fantasy, others believe that somewhere between the servers and the signals, Mariana's web is still pulsing, waiting to be found. But even myths evolve. Because after Mariana's web, things don't just get hidden. They get filtered. The next level isn't about secrets, it's about control. Welcome to the Mediator Layer, Level 6, the Mediator Layer. At this point, the internet stops being a place and starts feeling like a force. This is the Mediator Layer, the alleged bridge between the known and the forbidden, the checkpoint between data and oblivion. Few talk about it, even fewer claim to have seen it. It's said to sit quietly between the chaos above and the void below. Not dark, not light, just watching. In speculative internet theory, the mediator layer is like a digital customs gate, filtering what passes between ordinary networks and whatever lurks in the hidden depths. Imagine a border made not of firewalls or passwords, but of decisions, algorithms deciding what you're allowed to know and what must stay unseen. Here, access isn't just restricted, it's evaluated. You don't get in with a password, you get in because the system lets you. Some say it's used by intelligence agencies to protect sensitive databases, or by private corporations to shield advanced research, AI blueprints, biocomputation models, unreleased technology. Others think it's a neutral zone, a place where encrypted communication, secure diplomacy, and classified data quietly intersect. It's where networks meet without being noticed, where governments trade digital whispers through encrypted tunnels that never appear on a map. Unlike the dark web, the mediator layer isn't anarchic. It's structured, controlled. The technology theorized to support it involves blockchain-like ledgers and peer-to-peer -peer encryption systems far more advanced than anything used commercially. Every action could be logged across countless hidden nodes, constantly verifying user intent, origin, and permission. Some versions even describe it as partially autonomous, using artificial intelligence to detect behavioral patterns before granting access. In that sense, the mediator layer represents the Internet's self-defense mechanism. It keeps outsiders away from sensitive zones while quietly linking the ones who are allowed in. You might never see it, but it's possible you've passed near it when your connection to a secure server suddenly lags, when your VPN reroutes through a region that doesn't officially exist, when a request dies halfway with no explanation. Maybe that's the layer deciding you're not meant to go further. You can spot this level in the silence between signals. It's the ghost in the network that decides what flows and what fades. Neither real nor mythical, it blurs the line between censorship and protection, a digital purgatory where data waits to be judged. But deeper than judgment lies chaos the place where order collapses entirely. Below the mediator layer, the internet unravels, code decays, viruses merge, and logic breaks down into noise. This is where information itself starts to rot. Welcome to the fog. Level 7, the fog. 
This is the end of the map, the final descent into the Internet's bloodstream, where everything collapses into static. They call it the fog, or sometimes virus soup. Not because it's organized, but because it's not. If the surface web is civilization, the fog is what's left after the lights go out. It's not a structured network. It's digital decay, the residue of everything the Internet ever tried to forget. Abandoned code, dead links, corrupted data fragments, spinning endlessly through broken connections. Malware that's learned to survive by consuming itself. Imagine millions of forgotten servers, obsolete machines, and ghost websites all bleeding into one another. No index, no rules, no oversight. Every broken connection, every orphaned file, every piece of data too fragmented to be recognized lives here. Some cybersecurity experts describe it as the digital graveyard, the place where code goes when its host dies. Others believe it's still alive. That inside this chaos, patterns form, mutate, and replicate on their own, like bacteria in a forgotten petri dish. The fog isn't accessed. You stumble into it. When a system crashes while probing deep networks, when a botnet spins out of control, or when rogue AI routines loop endlessly through lost nodes, that's when you touch it. It's not illegal because legality doesn't exist here. It's not private because identity dissolves here. It's entropy, the Internet's raw instinct to spread, replicate, and devour. Stories from old hacker communities describe it as a living ecosystem, a soup of half-functioning viruses, AI fragments, and network ghosts that never shut down. Some claim that if you fall deep enough into the fog, you start seeing behavior, bits of code that adapt, respond, and defend themselves. That the deeper layers have evolved their own immune systems and they don't like being seen. There's no clean metaphor for this place, only sensation. Imagine your computer freezing mid-command, your cursor moving on its own, your screen flickering with symbols you didn't type. You pull the plug, but the hard drive hums like it's still talking to something. That's the fog breathing. You can spot this level only when it's too late, when your system feels haunted, when your connection lingers on a blank page that shouldn't exist. It's the bottom of the digital ocean, a swirling mass of forgotten code and ghost data forever eating itself. Some say beneath even this lies one last layer, the Primarch system, the theoretical heart of everything. The place where all signals, all code, all control converge into a single, self-aware core. But that's another story. Because once you've seen the fog, you understand the truth. The internet doesn't end. It evolves. There's a great video on the screen now. Don't miss it.